All right. So, you know, it's a couple um, minutes past 6.30 p.m. in Singapore, and we are actually good to go. So I'm Ronal, marketing producer with General Assembly. And, you know, on behalf of the team, I would really like to thank all of you for taking the time off your busy schedules to join us for this event. Um, today, we have with us marketing expert Sotirius, and he's going to be sharing with you some tips to generate creative marketing ideas when you feel like you're, you know, having the marketer's version of a writer's block. Um, but before I pass over the time to him, um, I'm just going to do a very quick, um, you know, introduction of General Assembly and cover some housekeeping matters. So kindly bear with me, especially if you're someone who's attended before. Thank you. Okay, so in case you haven't heard about General Assembly before this, we're actually a global tech education company founded in 2011. Currently, we have around 30 plus campuses around the world, both an online and offline presence. We mainly focus on tech, data, and design courses, aiming to bridge the gap between traditional education and the job skills today's employees um, demand. So if you're interested to know more about GA or our courses, you can actually get in touch with us. I will share the details in a bit. Um, but just before that, um, you know, how you can participate in GA's live stream is that if you notice, this is a live stream webinar, so you're actually not visible or audible to anyone. So please do not worry about any distracting noises or any distracting backgrounds, all good there. And if you do look at the bottom of your screen, you can actually see that you have access to a couple of functions. So some of you have already started using the chat to introduce yourselves, and that's really great. Do remember to toggle to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can, you know, the, your message is visible to everyone. And if you have any questions regarding the content or for a general assembly, then please do make sure to pop it in the Q&A box because that's how we'll be able to see the questions very clearly and you know, get to them as soon as we can. Try not to put them in the chat box because then there's a chance that we'll actually end up missing out and that's not something we'd want. Of course, if you remember any questions post the session, not to worry. You can just reach out to us um, at Singapore at General Assembly or even you know, check out our offerings on General Assembly, our website. And, you know, you can feel free to even join us on our social media pages. So we have a couple there. That's where we share some exciting events that we are running in GA Singapore. Um, and speaking of some exciting events, we do have, as part of our marketing week, a few more exciting events coming up tomorrow as well. So do check it out. And if you're interested, do join us. Um, yeah, you can just RSVP at the ga.co slash sgmarketingweek, the URL provided there. And lastly, if you want to take your learning one step further with us, take 50% off all our paid workshops with this code, which is bootcamp50. It's a discount code. So feel free to use this to sign up for any of our workshops. Yeah, and that's all from me. On that note, I'm going to pass the time over to Satirius, who's going to take us through this very exciting learning journey. Satirius, over to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Murnal, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Just give me one sec to open up my screen. OK, so first of all, good morning, good evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Sotirios. I always say that my name is a little bit weird because I come originally from Greece, but I lived most of my life as an expat. So I started working in media agencies in London, UK, from there, I moved to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, and from Dubai, I moved to Singapore. All of this time, I was working in media agencies until I switched to becoming an instructor and also a consultant on the side. We have a ton of things to go through, so we're going to get started immediately. If you have questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section. The more questions we get, the better it's going to be for everyone that is here today. Okay, so we are all here to discuss how we can come up with creative ideas, especially when we are feeling stuck, right? So the first thing that we need to know is that we don't need to be a guru to generate creative ideas. And generating creative ideas is not the privilege of the few, the people that have the truth, and then there are some other people that are not creative, right? So everyone can generate creative ideas. Anyone can be creative, even if you don't know how to draw or you don't know how to, let's say, do copywriting, it doesn't really matter, right? Creativity is more of a muscle and it can definitely be trained. It's something that can be taught and it's something that we can definitely improve. 
as long as we have the right creative diet or as long as we know how to think when it comes to creativity, right? So like everything in life, the more you train this creative muscle, the better ideas you're going to come up with. And this is what we need to discuss today. So typically everything starts with a brief, not a brief like the one that you see here in the cartoon, but typically when it comes to creative ideas, the process start with a campaign that we need to launch, the process start with an objective that we need to tackle, the process starts with a problem that we have as a business, right? At this stage, there are certain things that we need to think about to make the most out of, let's say, the brief and this starting point, right? So when it comes to briefs, three do's and don'ts. First of all, we need to understand who is the audience, why are we coming up with this creative idea or who is going to be the recipient of this creative idea? What is the problem we are trying to solve? So you always need to have a problem. This can be a business problem, a communication problem. We need to be solving a problem. We don't want to come up with ideas for the sake of coming up with an idea. It has to be functional, right? And what is the ideal outcome? So when we come up with this amazing idea, what do we expect to get out of it? What is the ideal outcome that we want to get? At this stage, common mistakes that we often make and they limit our creativity is we tend to pigeonhole ourselves by thinking about channels and formats too early. So instead of exploring ideas, we start actually saying, oh, we need to do a video, right? So we're going straight into the format or we need to create some stories. We're going straight into the channel and the format. So that's a big mistake, right? So we shouldn't actually pigeonhole ourselves that early. Another common mistake is buzzwords, like you see here in the cartoon. So we try basically to use nice adjectives and these nice, nice adjectives most likely they're going to put us off. Or we have a vague objective. We don't really understand why we need to come up with this creative idea. An alternative approach now to a traditional brief and something that I'm going to advocate today is this matrix that we're going to discuss here, right? So it is a framework for communication. This framework has two axes to begin with that will allow us to organize ourselves when it comes to what we want to achieve out of this creative idea. On the horizontal axis, we go from an explicit message, which is a message based on clarity to an implicit message which is a message that is based on emotion. And on the vertical axis, we go from people who are interested in the brand to people who are disinterested in the brand. That's relevant to our audience, right? Now, depending on where we play, we need to tackle different communication objectives. And there are four communication objectives that are always the same if we are to use this framework. If we want to target people who know our brand, and we want to target them with, let's say, an emotional message, what we are really trying to do is to reinforce an existing association. So what does this mean? For example, Singapore Airlines is known for being trustworthy and luxurious. We are trying to reinforce this message to people who already know Singapore Airlines. Um, Etihad Airlines is known to be the most luxurious airline. We are trying to reinforce this message to people who know Etihad Airlines. Volkswagen is known for superior technology. We are trying to reinforce this message. So whenever we are playing in the top right quadrant, we are targeting people who are interested in the brand and we want to go with an emotional message. What we are really trying to do is to reinforce an existing association. So people already know our brand. We just need to reinforce what is positive about it. If we are playing on a different quadrant. We want to target people who don't know our brand and we want to go the emotional side to raise the brand awareness. What we are trying to do is to build an association. For example, we want to associate our beverage with the best taste. We want to associate our restaurant with the best service. We want to associate our product with best quality. We want to associate our software as a service with the best technology. So we are trying to build an association here in that quadrant. Going on the left side now, right? So clarity messages. If we are targeting people who know who we are, sometimes we, all we want to do is to inform them of a new product or to guide them to take an action, right? So this is a different type of message maybe that we need to, to broadcast and plan for, right? And sometimes 
the hardest communication objective is when we are targeting people who don't know us and at the same time we want them to take an action right so these are basically four quadrants and the first thing that we need to do as an alternative to the classic brief approach is we need to decide where do we play so when we want we want to come up with a creative idea why we want to do that where do what the actually we are trying to do are we talking to people who know us are we talking to people who don't know us are we going with an emotional message we want to build an association or reinforce an existing one or we want them to pro we want to prompt them to take an action or let's say we want to impact them to take the first step to uh let's say know our brand or meet our brand right and the trick here is that we can choose only one this is not because we are mean this is because that if we try to do too many things all at the same time, most likely we're going to fail, right? So we need to be very cynical and really understand what is this creative idea all about? Like what are we trying to do here? Are we playing the emotional game, the awareness game, the, let's say, more um, top of mind awareness for our brand game? Or we want some action. We want people to do something specific, right? We need to have clarity in our message, right? So if you try to say too many things and do too many things, when you communicate something, then probably we are going to fail, right? So we don't want that. So we need to select which quadrant we belong to, right? And the next bit that we need to do is we need to answer a very straightforward question, which is if we want people to remember one thing from this campaign that we're going to run or one thing from this creative or one thing from this idea that we're going to launch what would it be the answer to this question is going to be the summary of your key message right so very often even though we know for example where we play and even though we know what we are trying to achieve and what is the objective what is the problem we are tackling we don't really have clarity on what is the one thing that we want people to remember if you can choose only one thing that people are going to remember when they see your video your ad your facebook uh, campaign your story what what is it right so this needs to be your key message or your call to action right now a little bit more on creating associations or how we need to think right so this is the foundation that's the starting point that's very very important questions to answer before we even start thinking about let's do this or let's do that right unless we have absolute clarity on what we are trying to achieve, what is the problem we are solving, who is the audience, what is the ideal outcome, what is the one thing that people want to re need to remember, it's not advisable to proceed with coming up with ideas because whatever ideas we come up, they're not going to be aligned or focused on something, right? So we need to do some groundwork first, which is actually quite cool to go through and ask yourself these questions. When it comes now to creating associations, if we are to play on the emotional side, which is the most interesting one when it comes to um, marketing and when it comes to campaigns, and keep in mind that humans are heavily rational creatures. Most of the decisions we are making are nonsense. They are based on emotions only. They are not based on facts. 90% or even more of the decisions we make on a daily basis are emotional first not really based on pure facts and pure data right that's why emotions will always be more effective in marketing comparing to any other logical argument that we need to make like uh, something that appeals to emotion if let's say we say we need to help these poor people because they are so poor and they have this sentimental story is going to be much more powerful as opposed to saying there are x percentage of poor people in the world and blah 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 Right? So emotion full messages are much better than emotionless messages. So most of the marketing is revolving around associations. But how can we approach that now? Building associations, it's quite easy as long as you grasp what is, uh, what is the task at hand. We're going to start the opposite way, however. We're going to try to unpack some existing ads out there just to understand what is going on behind the scenes. So I borrowed some amazing ads from a link that I found online. So this is an ad from FedEx. And you can see here there is a map. There are two people. One person is opening the window, passing a box to another person. 
if I'm, I ask you now, and I want you to think about this for a moment individually, what are the associations you are making when you look at this image? What are the things that you grasp immediately from the visual and what is happening here in, in this image? You are probably going to give me more or less similar answers. First thing that is obvious, is we are talking about an international setting. Why we're talking about an international setting? Because there is a world map. Immediately I see the map, I make the association, international. We are talking about fast delivery. Why we're talking about fast delivery? Because they pass the box from one person to the other. And how am I sure that we're talking about delivery? Because that's a shipping package here. So you can see that we have a visual that has zero text on it, absolutely zero. But because of the way they use the visuals, we immediately make the associations that we need and we create a message. Something that is very important when it comes to creativity and marketing also is rather than saying to people or communicating in words and trying to explain ourselves, we need to basically present something to people and let them craft the message themselves. Let them actually discover the message for themselves. That's the most effective marketing so that's an example of creating associations example number two we have an amazing ad here from tabasco when you look at this image what comes to mind some people will say volcano some people will say fire some people will say hot some people will say spicy that's exactly the association we're creating here there is a mouth that looks like a volcano there is fire fire, volcanoes associated with hot, with spicy. We are Tabasco. So again, without really any text, we can broadcast the message that we want, right? So that's more or less what we mean creating associations, right? So as long as I know what I want to broadcast as a message, I can think about images that reflect that message. And that will make my job as a creative, let's say, marketer or as an artist, for example, much easier when it comes to developing, let's say, the right message. And the third ad here, if we are to do a little bit of unpacking, is from Aspirin. So the moment we see this helmet, basically, with Aspirin, what comes to mind? What associations we make? First of all, it's a helmet. I already said it, basically, naturally, right? So helmet means protection, means something strong. Then we see this helmet basically attached to an aspirin that looks like a head. So strong protection from headaches. You see that the message here is super clear without a single word actually being present in the image. So that's all these things are examples of building associations or tapping into existing associations, right? So essentially, in order to project the right message, very often we have to either tap on existing associations or tap on, let's say, the associations that we want to create, right? So if we are to go now with an example ourselves, and for this, I will need your help, right? So let's say we have a brief that is very, very simplistic in our case, right? So the brief is to target busy middle upper class workers, upper class employees working in corporates, think CBD Singapore. The product is a luxury staycation package. The key benefit is to relax and unwind. The question that I have to you now is, what does relaxing and unwinding means for you? If I tell you relax and unwind, or if you are to think about relaxing and unwinding, what are the images that come into your mind? What do you associate relaxation and unwinding with? Any thoughts? You can use the chat actually to to tell me what you feel is relaxing and unwinding here for you. Beats. Sounds good. What else? Poolside, mojitos, the sea, Sentosa Island. So you can see immediately we know what we want to project as a message. We can make visual associations in our brain already, right? Silence, peaceful. There is, is, is always more than one answer. So everything starts actually, when it comes to creativity, everything starts from that stage. As long as we have a brief that we know the audience, the product, the key benefits, 
and what we want to do, where we want to play, then we need to actually ask ourselves the message that we want to project, what association can we build or what association can we tap on? And here I have a collection from which, let's say, you already told me a lot of these things. So uh, buy the pool with a beer, breakfast in bed, golfing, silence, sea, sleeping in, nature, spas, all these things are relaxing and unwinding. So we start with a brainstorming, right? And from there, the next step is always to start symbol. So great creatives like the ones that we showcased, they are not, let's say, coming from the sky. Again, we're not going to sit under a tree and suddenly say, say, oh my God, I came up with this amazing idea. That's it. It's a process. The process starts with what do we want to communicate? Let's try to, to brainstorm associations. What can we do with these associations now? That's th step number two. So now that we have these associations, the simplest creative that we can we can generate is the audience, male or female, white collar worker, Singaporean, golfing, sleeping in, breakfast in bed, by the seaside, blah, blah, blah. That's the starting point. And then from there, we can elaborate. From there, we start symbol and we start getting more creative. So what can we replace the Singaporean male or female with? What can we replace the sea or the spa or everything with? Then we start throwing maybe a little bit more edgy, edgy ideas, or we start actually thinking about how we can enhance this first version of our message, right? So always remember that creativity and coming up with creatives and creative ideas is a process. It's not going to, you're not going to come up with this amazing idea immediately. But if you take it step by step and you follow the process and you trust the process, eventually you're going to reach out here. So somebody started by saying, we want to communicate, we are hot, we are spicy. We want to communicate, let's say we are international, we are fast and we do fast delivery. We want to communicate strong protection from headaches. What is strong? What is protection? What comes to mind when it comes to headaches? First, they create something simple, then they try to enhance it and think a little bit harder until they reach this point here and you say, oh, that's an amazing creative. How did they think about it? They didn't think about it in one go. They thought about it in stages, right? So that's something that's very often, especially when we are in startups or as clients, we feel that our creative agency has all these gurus. They, they go in the room when there is, uh, let's say, full moon and suddenly the idea comes up. It's not exactly like that, right? So. It, it's more of a structured process, a lot of back and forth, a lot of thinking hard, brainstorming, taking the brainstorming, coming up with something simple, then enhancing this something simple. From there now, what we need to do? Obviously, we need to start thinking about how we're going to take this concept and we're going to deliver it in different media, social media, TV, radio, podcasts, and so forth, right? And what we often forget is that as humans, we have five senses. Uh, unless you see ghosts, then you have six senses, right? But typically, most of us have five senses, okay? So taste, hearing, sight, smell, and touch is not all about sight. We can also play with audio. We can also recall the taste. Sometimes you see a visual a cake and immediately it's as if it reminds you of a taste or reminds you of a smell. It's great marketing of some cookie shops is they let the smell of baking, baked products actually go out in the street, right? And they market like that, right? So humans have five senses and we can play with these five senses. Now, obviously why the majority of marketing relies on video and visuals is because there are basically three types of humans. There are humans that they learn and they can absorb information better through audio. That's 30% of the population. There are humans that are visual learners. That's 65% of the population. And there are humans that are more of kinesthetic learners, means they, they learn and they absorb information by doing, right? So an audio visual message is going to cover the majority of the audience out there. You have 95% of the audience covered with a video, which is audio visual. That's why video is very powerful, right? Because it applies to people who are visual communicators and learners, and also to people who like sound. 
Uh, but there are these three types of people among us, right? So even in this group, some people are better, let's say, absorbing information visually. Some people like to hear and listen. And maybe you're just listening to me and you're doing other things in your laptop now, right? So that's why videos are the most powerful formats. However, it's not the only format, right? So we can go with visuals, we can go with text, we can go with a video, we can go with sound, and we can even play also with the other senses like smell, touch. We can do that in outdoor media, for example. We can do that in cinemas. We can do that if we have a physical store. Everything matters for marketing, right? So don't, again, when you start brainstorming ideas, don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't pre-decide that, oh, this is going to be a video, right? So keep an open, uh, open room for, let's say, inspiration and ideas. And maybe you can translate this idea in a lot of different forms. So the same key concept that you're going to come up, maybe we can take this thing and we can attach some animation on top of it. And then we're going to make it a small video. We can take this one and we can create a script and we can convert it into a podcast or an article, right? So there are a lot of ways to communicate uh, our creative ideas and we shouldn't decide them beforehand. This should come at the, la at the last stage. A lot of you will probably ask, I don't know if it's already a question in the Q&A, what is the best type of creative, right? So I think we already gave the answer. So 95% of the people anywhere they are visual or auditory types of characters. Therefore, video is the best type of creative. However, is not the format that makes the creative sign is the message in the end of the day. You can have a simple LinkedIn post or a simple article, for example, and it can be super impactful. You can have a single, let's say, radio ad and it can be super impactful because of the message, not the vehicle. So it's not the fact that it's a video that is going to make your, your message actually understood. It's the message itself. And channels don't have anything to do with whether people are going to absorb your message. Whether you go on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, or any other channel, channels are simply the avenues to reach people. They are the vehicles also that carry your message, right? But the, what really matters is the communication, right? So what are you telling to people? This is what really matters. Now, whether you're going to have it in the MRT, in uh, let's say as outdoor advertising, as, as audio, as a video, that uh, is of little importance. The most important part is the message that we're going to create. Okay, so that's kind of summarizes section number one of what I want to broadcast to you today. Uh, we have a section two also that is very interesting in the context of what we're discussing because nowadays storytelling is very popular. It's a buzzword that we like to, to let's say, hear about and we like to adopt uh, storytelling. We like to believe that we are storytelling, we are storytellers, we are sending stories. Everyone speaks about stories. How can we create a story now? Again, it's all about the process. Great stories don't fall from the sky. No one sat under a tree and suddenly they said, oh, I have an amazing story that just came to my mind, all of it in one go. We need to structure our story and we need to take steps to structure our story. So we are going to follow the same logic. First, we are going to unpack some existing stories commercial stories that are out there. So I selected two Singapore focused ads that they broadcast on YouTube and also on TV to unpack. The first one, you may have seen it before, I think it's pretty old, is this one here. So let's actually watch it. It's one minute and then we're going to unpack it. Wow, ben has been gambling a lot lately. Maybe I should do something. What's the worst that can happen? At most, you get thrown out of school and kicked out of the house. Expel for gambling? You get out of my house! Now! And then I'll have to start taking care of him. Lending him money again and again. Until he finally steals my credit card for illegal online gambling. Looks like we've got one! Send in the team! Go, go, go! the SWAT team is preparing to raid the flag of a suspected illegal online gambler. 
And I'll get thrown in jail. <gasps> Maybe I will do something. Stop it. Don't let gambling become a problem. Take action now. Okay, so how can we unpack this story now, right? So every story, first of all, has a hero. Right? We cannot have a story without a hero. The hero in this case is a millennial Singaporean, right? Every story or almost every story has a villain or maybe more than one villain. The villain in this case is a gambler. Every story takes place somewhere. There is a battleground. There is a location. There is a context, basically, of where the problem takes place, right? So the battleground here is finding the strength to take some action, right? So finding this mental strength to do something. And every story has an outcome, right? So it has the moral of the story, as we call it, right? So here is basically save lives, right? So first, what we need to understand is, again, that we can take any story and we can chop it into pieces, right? And if we know the elements, the variables that make a story, then we can actually construct stories as we go. And we can be very efficient and very creative of doing that, right? Now, a second example, again, coming from Singapore, very sore ad if we are to unpack it quickly it's all very quiet but born and raised on these streets we know they'll fight back fires will blaze and the streets will burst with life again okay so how can we unpack this story right the villain here who is the villain COVID-19 came in and made everything silent. Who are the heroes of the story? Us, the people, right? What is the battleground, the streets? What is the key message? There is, we need to stay strong, have faith. And how are we going to do that by supporting our FMB outlets, right? So you can see that stories basically are hidden messages. In both cases, we could just create another that is very boring and very simple. We could go the literal approach saying, don't gamble because it's bad for you or because it's going to do X and Y. The rational way. The rational way typically doesn't connect. So we created a story of a person that is fighting with the strength of, let's say, helping his friend. In the second case, we could also go the boring way. We could create a story and say, support our FMBs because they are hit hard and this is how much money they lost and blah, blah, blah. Not emotional message is not going to connect. Therefore, we create a story, right? So the story of the streets, that we are the heroes, that we are waiting silently and we are helping basically everyone to recover, right? So again, every story has components, right? And there are also frameworks to create stories that can even help us a little bit more. Some of the most common frameworks that we have out there is the monomyth. The monomyth summarizes pretty much 90% of all the movies that we see out there they follow this framework lion king there is a lion something happens they he goes on a journey he comes back he becomes a king game of thrones there is Jon snow he goes to the wall a lot of things happen he comes back spoiler alert he becomes a king most movies and most stories out there they are basically monomyths they have a single hero there is a problem and a set of obstacles that they overcome, and then they emerge wiser on the other side. Commercially, now that's very easy to use. You have a hero. The hero is your target audience. You have an adventure. The adventure is the problem you are solving with your product or with your service. And we have the hero emerging wiser on the other side when they are using your product or your service. So your product or your service is the solution that takes this hero from a small lion and makes it king of the jungle. Very, very easy actually to take the monomyth and convert it into a commercial setting, right? That's not the only framework, right? So we have other frameworks that are extremely uh, cool and very, uh, very creative also, the spark lines. So the gambling ad that we've seen follows this framework. So the spark lines is a play between a reality and an alternate reality. So you've seen, for example, this guy, he's imagining things, right? So they sit with friends and he's imagining what is going to happen if his friends continue uh, to gamble. And he's imagining an alternate reality. The same thing can be used 
you are, let's say, a staycation, um, a hotel offering staycations. The person is working and he's daydreaming holidays. The person is starting a startup and he's daydreaming success. The person is, let's say, starting uh, boxing classes or yoga classes and they are daydreaming life, being healthier and thinner and more flexible and so forth. The person takes this, uh, let's say, cream and dreaming about what is going to happen after they use it. It's life without your product, life with your product, spark lines, right? So that's another framework that we can we see quite often also being um, used even in some movies and also for commercial purposes. And then I have a third framework that even more actually out there, but just three that we're going to go through during this uh, short session that we're going through which is the pedal structure. So the pedal structure is basically different stories that they all connect to the same idea. There is a very, uh, let's say, well-known ad out there that is called Dove uh, Sketches. Maybe I'm going to share the link with you. And this ad, if you want to watch it, let's say, in your, in your laser time, is built on this framework is built on the pedal structure. So the pedal structure is basically, let's say, three, four different women that they had the same problem in their lives and they solved it in either a unique way or a way that involved your product or your service. Three different startups that they were in different industries, but they all use your software and they found success. Three different students that they all took your, progr your program and they actually emerged on the other end with very well-paid jobs. Three different, I don't know, uh, SMEs. They went to your bank and they took a loan to do something great, right? So the pedal structure is basically different stories, people starting from different backgrounds and different different walks of life. They have the same problem, and your product or service is the solution and is the glue basically that connects these stories together. They all use your product and they emerge on the other end victorious. So job number one when we create a story is first we need to choose our heroes our heroes are your, our target audience that's very easy because if you want the story to connect we need to tell a story that other people can actually relate to right if i start telling you a story about i don't know some uh, brandy in argentina for example you may not necessarily relate because most of you are from southeast asia or singapore right if uh, we tell a story of someone else that, let's say, from a foreign culture and so forth, maybe people are not going to relate. So uh, the heroes of our story need to mirror the audience that is going to use our product, as simple as that. Then we need to choose the villains. The villains, very straightforward, is the problem we are solving. We can personify this problem if we want to be a little bit more creative, or we can have it as a problem, let's say, lingering on top of, uh, the companies or the people who participate in the story. And then we need to choose our framework, right? Our framework means how are we going to, to work with these components, right? Are we going to go for a monomyth, a single person that is going to personify the total group of people we cater to and his adventure? Are we going to go with parallel realities? Are we going to go with multiple stories linking to the same idea? Are we going to use even different, let's say, frameworks that sometimes you can find out there, right? So what is the framework, the structure, the skeleton of our story? And from there, again, stories don't, don't come as one piece. They don't fall from the sky and say, oh, I had this idea, the whole story came to my mind, now I'm going to write it down. We're going to start sketching. Starting sketching means frame by frame. We have a person, let's say, we are General Assembly, and we have a person, I'm horrible in sketching, but it doesn't matter. And this person, let's say, studied something that he didn't like. He's not satisfied with his job. He's miserable. He's coming home with the MRT and he's thinking about quitting his current job. And he's depressed and blah, blah, blah. And then he finds our link online and he finds some courses. And he's like, oh, I really want to become a software engineer. And then he's not very sure. He finds out more about it, maybe, let's say, uh, the, his friends are supportive and they tell him, okay, let go and 
and have a uh, have a, a look at this course. He starts the course first. He's actually a little bit, let's say, reserved. Then he starts becoming better and better, and then he's hired by Google and he makes millions. That's a story of let's say General Assembly. The story of a person who started from a totally different background, satisfied with his job, and he found the job in Google. The story of the business that. They didn't have clarity on what they do or how they raise a startup. And they took a program, a VC fund, for example, and they got investment and they built a multi-million company. The story of a person who was not confident, he took boxing classes or yoga and they transformed their lives. The story of people who were very stressed and they took this retreat and suddenly the whole mindset changed. Right. So telling stories, it's a much more efficient way as opposed to just broadcasting a cynical message come to our meditation center come to our course come to our hotel uh take the skincare cream and so forth right and there are so many different ways you can project the story funny ways serious ways emotional ways less emotional ways so many different versions of your story right so the possibilities are endless as long as we know the components right because it's not about you don't have to start with an idea. You can start blind, which is what we are trying to, to communicate in this session. You can start with zero ideas, zero creativity. You can feel stuck. I don't have any idea how we're going to actually approach this problem. But if I know the components, if I know the ingredients that are behind the story or the ingredients that are going to help me to, to put together a creative or a visual, then I can very quickly actually put them together and start coming up with a lot of ideas. Now, we're going to reserve some time for questions. Uh, I just have one more slide that is going to be useful as a mindset, right? So what I often say to all my students is that in order to train our creative muscle, I mean, there are not people that can have great ideas and other people that cannot. It's just there are people who are curious and more observant or they train their creative muscle more. And there are people that they didn't train their creative muscle. The best way to train your creative muscle is to experience the world as a marketer. A lot of us, when we live our lives and we are busy and we are taking the MRT, the bus, we are going around in the streets, we don't really pay attention to marketing because we just ignore it. We say it's not relevant to me. I don't care about any ad that is in the MRT. I don't care about any video. I don't care about anything. But if you are in marketing and you work in marketing, you need to do exactly the opposite. It doesn't matter if the ad is not for you. You need to think about it. You need to look at the MRT as you're going home and say, if I were the marketer, would I approve this banner that I see here in the train? Does the message make sense? Does it resonate with me? Is it emotional? Is it functional? Is it for people who know the brand? Is it for new users? Is there a story behind it? Is there no story behind it? I see a YouTube, but they, they follow a framework. Who is the hero? Who is the villain? Who is the problem? Do they make good use of all these elements? Right? Is the story cohesive, right? Is this idea creative? I've seen lately a series of very, very, very creative McDonald's ads, for example, for Father's Day, right? So the more you observe, the more ideas you are going to to have when the time comes to think about your business right because the more you see basically these things and you think about them you think about how they thought about this idea or the elements they include and how they made use of these elements then the more you train this creative muscle right so experience the world as a marketer don't just ignore all the ads that's something that as professionals we need to do we know that almost nothing is relevant to us personally but just as of sheer curiosity, it will really make you a better artist, a better creative director, a better uh, graphic designer, a better marketer, a better brand manager. If you start observing what is going on around you as an exercise, right? So you are not doing it because you want to buy these things. You are doing it just as a research and have a notebook or open your mobile phone, take pictures, take ideas, note down things to remember all these things, right? So have a depository of ideas. I found that this is helpful for me because I tend to forget things very easily. Okay, great. So that was the last slide I had for today. I hope that was an, it was an inspiring session. But before we wrap up, 
of course, we're going to go into questions. So we have five questions at the moment. Just to share. Okay. So the first one is another question. Uh, this ad is from a decade ago. Okay. So I didn't know how old is this ad, but I use it as an example of Sparklines framework, right? Because it's, it's just bang on that framework, the way they build it. Uh, would the storing flames framework work for non-video formats? It can work for non-video formats, yes, because you can do carousel ads, for example. So the same way you create a video. So imagine this video, instead of being animated, you can just have the frames of a carousel ad. Or you can make a simple animation. So imagine something like a cartoon. So two, three frames with some moving uh, elements, for example. So it doesn't have to be a video, per se. Narration also. Myself, I'm a very big fan of stories, not marketing stories, just stories for kids and stories for uh, history and all that. So I like narrations. I like actually listening to stories verbally. So the same way you can actually create it as a video, you can create a narrative, right? So definitely it can work for a different formats, right? So either carousels, plain visuals, or even let's say um, audio. I don't think it works very well for text, but I think for these two formats, it will probably work. Uh, does the storing frame framework you share work for articles, blogs? Um, I don't think you can, I, I don't, I mean, I never tried to, to convert these frameworks into articles, to be fair, right? Um, but I can see a lot of these stories on LinkedIn as posts, not really articles. Let me see, because I think I've seen a story lately on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, if I manage to grab, to, to get it, basically, I'm going to pause here. Uh, but a lot of posts on LinkedIn, sometimes they follow this hero journey, right? So I was reading a story, basically, um, don't know if this is a story basically here, but I was reading a story before I entered this, this um, uh, session from someone in Egypt that he had a problem with the family and how basically things evolved. Uh, while he was working in a logistics role and how he was trying to, let's say, balance family issues with work. And then eventually he find a better uh, working environment that uh, basically appreciate him more, right? So um, it may not work per se for an article, but it definitely works for a LinkedIn post. It definitely works for a Facebook post. Uh, it definitely works for a podcast or an interview. Um, you can experiment, however, right? So I didn't do it in an article format myself, but you can you can potentially explore these frameworks for that, right? Uh, how far can you stretch the creative messaging, push the boundaries, while still target the ideal outcome? It, it really depends on how, um, let's say, flexible you are as a brand. There are brands out there that they are very they are very, let's say, out there. For example, there is Death with Coffee that has a very interesting branding, for example, a uh, company based in, in the US. If you, if you go basically on their, um, let's say, Instagram page, you will see that what they do actually is, is very bold in terms of the messaging, in terms of, let's say, the, they use memes, they use jokes, sometimes they swear also. So it really depends on, on your brand positioning also, right? How far you can actually stretch out the idea. Some brands are more conservative. Some brands are more, let's say, innovate, not innovative, more, let's say, extroverts. My recommendation is to try to understand we, who are you talking to, right? Because if, let's say, your, your audience are extroverts, since I, I said this word now, and they are basically very outgoing and they like trying new things and they are young, maybe you can actually stretch your idea too far uh, or you can actually be very, very experimenting. But if your audience is a little bit more conservative, a little bit, let's say, older demographics, a little bit more, let's say, your industry you are in, it, it revolves around trust. If, let's say, you are an insurance company or a bank, you may not want to go that far because your brand positioning doesn't allow you, right? So we all have a, a personality. If let's say you are dealing with introverts, introverts sometimes are scared if you actually go that far, right? So you need to understand who is on the other end. Are you talking to extroverts? Are you talking to introverts? Are you talking to young people, old people, and then make decisions 
based on that, right? Um, regarding the quant that you presented earlier, can we use one of it if my service or content is targeted to entirely different audiences? Uh, you can do that, I guess. Yeah, that's that I've seen also the framework being used like that. That's a framework that is being used by one of the biggest companies out there. I cannot reveal, obviously, who the company is. Uh, I kind of stole it in a way from them, uh, although they don't have any copywriting or anything. It's just a frame of thinking. Um, but I guess you can use it for different products or services, right? And the, this is the idea. The idea is that sometimes we are going to talk to our own customers. Sometimes we're going to talk to new customers. Sometimes we just want to build a brand, meaning motion. Sometimes we just want people to take an action. Uh, so depending on the scenario or the campaign, we just want to understand where we are playing, right? Uh, that's really a really interesting framework to, to work with. Um, on triggering an emotive response, which one works the best? Positive versus negative emotions. How do we manage the negative emotions from creative to avoid negative associations with the brand? Uh, that's a great question because negativity sells and it sells a lot. I'm personally not a fan of it, if you ask my opinion, but we cannot deny the fact that it sells. Anything that is, let's say, the world is getting destroyed, anything that is, let's say, on the negative side, it will sell because people like the drama. That's why Turkish drama series, Korean drama series are doing that great because drama sells also. I'm trying to open YouTube because very often we see, for example, or the market is going to crash, Bitcoin is going to go to the moon or something, let's say, you know, people kind of uh, destroying other people and negativity will sell. We know that, right? So the question is, as a brand now, do you want to associate your brand with negative emotions? I know brands, even on YouTube, for example, that they live from negative, they feed from negative emotions. They sell books, they sell ideas based on negative emotions. If you try to think a little bit more, you can think about politicians that feed on negative emotions or fear very often, right? So not to mention any names, but um, we know it sells. The question is, do we want to go down that route? For me, it's not really an option that I would select for any of my brands, for example, right? Because I feel that in the long term, positivity always wins. Even if, let's say, in the short term, you may be intrigued to create a video the world is getting destroyed tomorrow market is going to crash and the stocks are going to go to zero uh look at what these guys are doing let's actually go and start throwing stones to them and um, you may feel intrigued to let's say go on linkedin and bus certain tech companies and then people will resonate and you will get the engagement and all that i don't feel that in the long term is is something that in the end of the day people want to let's say, um, associate their lifestyle with, right? In the end of the day, the positivity will always win. Um, although, again, we, we can acknowledge the fact that it works, and that's why we see a lot of negativity, especially in social. Deliberate negativity also. So a lot of brands, they know what they're doing. They know that this video title is going to sell, and therefore they are using it. It's just a personal preference of me that I just prefer maybe positive angles instead of negative uh, negative emotions, right? Um, it's a decision you need to make as a brand. Sometimes brands need enemies, the same way states need enemies, the same way ideologies need an enemy to survive. If there is no enemy, they, there is no, let's say, um, there is no reason to be or to believe. So sometimes brands need to invent an enemy or, you know, like just, just to, to use for their benefit. Um, it's just up to you on how you want to, to play with this, right? Uh, can you give an example of the petal method? So the best example is the one I shared in the chat, right? So the petal structure is the, um, uh, the Dove Sketches campaign. So let me actually reopen uh, the, my tabs here and find it. So the, the Beauty Sketches campaign, right? So this ad... I'm not going to play it now because it's like six minutes, but if you watch it, it's about the story of four or five women that they didn't really consider themselves beautiful, and then they realized that in the eyes of other people, they are beautiful, right? So it's the Dove Sketches campaign, I think they won awards also with this. So this is an example of petal structure. 
but I've also seen it in in more down down to earth formats, right? So let's say five different startup founders talking about using a product and transforming their businesses. That's kind of a petal structure. It doesn't have to be as elaborate as a Dove campaign. Uh, it can be easier to to create. Uh, how do you persuade teams to take a step back and reevaluate what is being produced and start applying these frameworks when we are already so stressed? How do we demonstrate the value in this kind of thinking to marketing teams that are set in their ways? Uh, that's, that's a hard question, right? So um, I think you need to actually start using some of these concepts and frameworks and see them working in practice see them working better than this is the product, this is the price, buy the product now um, to, to demonstrate the value and to convince people, right? Uh, or maybe you need to showcase them example of brands like McDonald's, like Unilever, like uh, Tiger Beer, like Dove. There, there are so many examples on the web. If you go on YouTube and you type in best, uh, best let's say, TV ads, best YouTube ads, or you follow campaign magazine, for example, or equivalent publications that, that are always award-winning creatives and award-winning campaigns. Or if you follow creative people from agencies, they always publish a lot of creative ideas, right? So I think the scene is believing sometimes, right? So you need to showcase them the difference. You don't have to start by executing it, but you need to showcase them, you know, look at what these guys are doing, for example, and how boring or bland are our creatives, right? So we need to be a little bit more emotional. Um, obviously, again, it requires resources, right? I think the resource issue is is not very, it cannot really be solved that easily. In order to do these things, you need to have time or agencies or some resources to go through the process normally. Uh, but to be fair, I think anybody can spend maybe 10 or 15 more minutes to create a little bit more emotional Facebook ad or create maybe a better visual or not just throw a product and a price in a through Canva and just uh, call it an ad, right? So we can all at least improve a little bit more, um, even if we don't want to follow this, this, the process. Uh, but I get 100% where you are coming from, right? So unfortunately, I don't think I have a straightforward answer. What I would do is I would just show, show them examples of what other companies do to inspire them and hopefully to to get the buy to try these things. Do you have any favorite sources of inspiration for stories? Uh, sources of inspiration for stories. Uh, first of all, I would advise you to follow, let's say, resources like campaign campaignasia.com. Uh, I will advise you to follow people that are creative directors or creative directors within agencies in Southeast Asia or other places. Ogilvy, um, Leo Bennett, TBWA, uh, JWT. Just find people who are into the creative business and follow them. And then they can actually, um, let's say, give you a lot of inspiration. Uh, there are certain brands that innovate very often. For example, Burger King had some amazing uh, case studies. Again, recently McDonald's. So keep an eye on all these other ads. Um, and maybe just, just follow the people, especially through LinkedIn, and then you will be exposed to a lot of these case studies. Right? Maybe you can follow awards also, especially creative awards, and you can see, for example, what goes in cans, who won it, who were the contenders, and so forth. Right? So if you keep an eye on all these big events and the industry, you will get a lot of ideas. But the best tactic that I use is, apart from all these um, sources, right? So the best tactic is ideas can come from anywhere. I mean, even if you if you just go for a walk in CBD Singapore, you will definitely find something that is interesting and creative in the most unexpected places, right? So just try to be more observant looking around looking in malls bus stops and all that and you will see that you'll get a lot of inspiration without really needing to follow through these sources uh, which framework is the most impactful in terms of getting viewers to take an action towards a brand and do you have any tips on making impactful creative visuals um the the answer i'm going to give you is not my observation right so based on data for example from facebook stories that are non-linear 
are more memorable. Non-linear means if, let's say, the monomyth is a linear story. There is a, a start, a middle, and an end. A story that is non-linear is probably going to work better uh, in terms of memorability. Uh, maybe start from the end. The end of the story is the the person already works at Google, and then he goes backwards in his life and he thinks about how he got started. Right. So that's something more memorable as opposed to, uh, let's say, a linear story in a way. Or if you, let's say, do a collage or maybe the petal structure, all these things are not very, let's say, beginning, middle, end. Based on research, again, that is done by these companies, um, they tend to be more memorable. Uh, anything with movement tends to work better. So animations, moving um, text, moving uh, images, uh, anything that this video obviously does much better than, uh, let's say, statics. Because, and again, the reason that, that does much better is not just, um, is, is the, the science, right? It's because they, it captures the audio people, it captures also the people who learn visually, right? So that's why it does better, because video is the ultimate format in a way, uh, if we can say it like that, right? Um, well, this doesn't mean that everything else is useless, right? So anything can work as long as we have a strong message, right? So a symbol, again, a symbol LinkedIn post with your story as a person or somebody else's story sometimes get becomes viral um, and goes very far. So we don't have to overstress about creatives. And I think with creatives, maybe you need to... Also, creativity comes when you are not really stressed or, um, let's say, imprisoned by do's and don'ts so if you start let's say ignoring completely what works what doesn't work the channel or maybe some um concepts that uh, society norms and all these things and you start thinking freely then you're going to come up with better ideas uh typically okay great so that was the last question so that's it for today i hope you enjoyed the session as much as i did and see you next time. Back to Mrunal to close over. Thank you session. so much, Sotiris. That was really great. Um, I know for sure I'm going to go check out Campaign Asia right after this session. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you to our attendees for attending this session. As always, we'll be sure to send you the recording um, in a couple of days. So just hang in there. And have a good evening or afternoon or you know, whichever time of the day you are at right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Bye.